I invite you, if you would, to find in your Bibles, if you would like, uh, Philippians chapter 2. It's the book that we have been uh, reading out of for the last two or three months. And it, uh, believe it or not, has the Christmas story in it. So I invite you to Philippians chapter 2. Once you find it, keep a finger there and flip back about five or six pages to the left and find the book of Galatians chapter 4, if you would. We're going to read a few verses. Paul wrote both of these. Uh, he wrote them to churches that he had planted, and um, many of them in both churches were from a Jewish background, uh, not all, because in both of the cities of Galatia and Philippi, they were metropolitan cities, so uh, they had plenty of Gentiles. When I say the word Gentiles, y'all know what I mean, right? Just in case you don't, that means anybody who's not a Jew, Okay, that's the term for everybody else, all right? Now, let me just define briefly uh, where does the Jewish lineage come from? It comes from Abraham. If you go back and read the book of Genesis, there was not a nation that was known as the Jewish nation or Israelites before Abraham. So it's really not in its origin a specific nationality. Okay. It says that Abraham was chosen to be the father of a nation because of his great what? Faith. Because of his faith in God, he was chosen. As a result, those who follow in the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob okay, are part of the nation of Israel and thus are called Jews. But that was not the only way to become an Israelite or a Jew. There were many during the time in the promised land that we read, all right, about those who the term in those days was proselytized to Israel. In other words, they left the worship of their foreign gods. There were, there were those who uh, were Philistines, all right, and Moabites who became believers in the God of Israel. And by what? Faith, same way Abraham became part of the Jewish nation, so did these from other nations because they put their faith in the God who had chosen Israel to be his connection to the world. All right? So today we often talk about them strictly as a culture or as an ethnicity, but we have to understand the key is faith. It is their faith in God who had revealed himself through Abraham and then through the nation that came from him as a result. And so nothing has really changed today in those who become Christians. It's not the color of your skin. It's not the culture of your background. But it is by faith in Jesus Christ that we become part of his family. So uh, that's the background. So in the New Testament times, when this church was just starting after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and church, churches were being started all over the world, there were sometimes Jews and Gentiles together in the same congregation because they were all believers in Jesus Christ. The Jews brought with them a, their culture, their background, all right, their tradition, their their manipulation of the law in their lives. And sometimes it was easy to resort back to that rather than continue to live in the beauty of God's grace. And so both the, the letter uh, that Paul wrote to uh, the church at Galatia plus the church at Philippi is a reminder of this incredible relationship we have with God that didn't come through the observance of the law, legalism, but came through the generosity of God's love that is called grace. And so I want to read those two passages and then we'll jump in at our uh, first Sunday of December. So Philippians chapter 2 Pick up at verse 5. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Now, when I was a kid growing up in church, there wasn't a new international version of the Bible. I know, Stone, that makes me old. But um, I, all the scriptures I memorized, I memorized in King James. And so the King James Version in this particular verse says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. I like that a little bit better because it's more than just about the shaping of an attitude. 
This, this is literally thinking the thoughts of God. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What was this mind that was in Christ? Who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him in the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus... Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. What does that mean? That means that humility ought to be the first thoughts in our mind as we think and do any thought or any action in our life. That doesn't come naturally. What that means for Tim Rowland this week is that at a turkey trot, it is okay to watch mothers pushing a baby carriage run past you. Humble himself. I didn't do too well Thursday morning at this. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. But when the time had fully come, 21st century language, when the time's right, when the time was per have there have been events in your life, circumstances, that you wanted it to be just the right time? Men, when you pop the question, I understand. Remember, I've, I've done about 1,500 weddings, and I've asked this question 1,500 times. Tell me about the proposal. I will tell you that there are some men who just say, uh, well, I just really didn't think about it. I just did it. If you're here and unmarried, I don't recommend that you ever say that out loud. All right? Um... Then I get these men who they think it, they plan it, they schedule it. Uh, did one, the, the guy was going to propose at a little park just outside of Huntington Lake. And he was going to do it on Thanksgiving Day. And it snowed two days before. He had to improvise. <laughs> then he dropped the ring in the snow. <laughs> <laughs> so you can plan it, and it doesn't, but, but, but most of us plan special things and we want it to be just the right time. So did God. When the time was just right, God sent his son. How? Born of a woman under the law to redeem those under the law that we might receive the full rights of sons and daughters. Because you are sons and daughters, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. Literally translated, Dear Daddy. A term of intimacy and closeness. So you are no longer a slave, but you are children. And since you are children, God has made you an heir. In our front yard that is fully decorated with a crushed tent, there are three large red Christmas ornaments that Shelley had made two years ago. They're big and round. They got the ornament top. They even have the ornament hook, all right, coming out of the top. And on each one of these are written two words, they form a sentence. You read from left to right. There are spotlights on all three of these big ornaments. Unto us, a child is born. For us, that is the theme and message of Christmas. Those are in the foreground of a nativity, inflatable nativity set. Shelley added a new cool piece this year. We now have an angel floating above She's actually sitting on a bush. 
looking down on this event. But unto us a child is born. Is there anything more intimate or personal than the birth of a child? In this commercialized Christmas culture that we live in today, we often lose sight of the personalization of why Jesus came to earth. So on this very first Sunday, I want us to make this very, very personal. There was a television interviewer about a decade ago who was walking the streets of Tokyo at Christmas time. Much as in America, Christmas shopping is a big commercial success. The interviewer stopped one young woman on the sidewalk and asked her, oh, tell me, what is the meaning of Christmas for you? <laughs> Laughingly, she thought, and then finally responded, ah, I, I don't know, it's, it's the day Jesus died. Well, she got the Jesus part right, okay? I'm, I'm grateful for that. But I don't know if you realize it or not, but there are a lot of people who really don't know the true origin and meaning of Christmas. And what I mean by that is there are many people who don't realize that the birth of Jesus really is what Christmas is all about. And even those of us that say we do know the true meaning of Christmas, it is very easy for us to forget it amidst all the shopping and the gift giving and the family get togethers and the donut making and all the good stuff to eat. We don't really know for certain what day that Jesus was actually born. But we do know for certain that he was born. And December 25th has been a date picked a long, long time ago as a time to remember and not forget the birth of Jesus. It was never, it was, I got news for you. Christmas was not started by Hallmark. Long before there was ever a Hallmark, there was a celebration of Christmas. And it wasn't often filled with decorations and presents and gift giving. It was a celebration like Easter to remember what Jesus Christ has done for us. So what is the meaning? What is this big deal about Christmas, particularly in the church? What's the hubbub all about? And that's what I want to attempt to either answer or maybe set perspective for us today. We might need a reminder about the significance and the meaning, just like they did at the church of Galatia when Paul wrote chapter 4, and at Philippi when he wrote chapter 2 and talked about the birth and experience of Jesus into the world. So in Galatians 4, and in Philippians 2, I think we find at least three things. Number one, this season is about the advent of the Savior. Now, that word advent, about the only time we hear about it is at Christmas time. How many of you have ever had an advent wreath or book at your house? Okay? Okay, so, and, and, and we thought, it's the advent of Christmas. What, what does advent mean? really mean? Technically, what is the definition of this word advent? Well, its literal definition goes like this. It is the arrival of a notable person, thing, or event. So, the story that's found in Matthew and Luke of the birth of Jesus Christ, that is the advent of Christ. That is the arrival of a notable person. God from heaven arriving on earth to be with us. That's the advent of a notable person. Now, for us as believers, actually it's true really for the world. I think I can safely say that. It's also the arrival of a notable event. And by that I don't mean the birth of Jesus. I mean the fullness of Christ. Because you see, if it wasn't for the resurrection that took place on Easter Sunday morning, nobody at any time in history would celebrate the birth of Jesus. So when we are approaching this season of Advent, we are remembering the arrival of a notable person in a most unusual way on earth, and we are remembering the totality of all that he did for the world in his death, burial, and resurrection. So the Advent of Christmas is really the advent of a notable person and the events that have changed the history of the world. Now, the other definitions of Advent is, this is the first season of the Christian church year. Okay? For those who come from high church, all right, 
Does that mean anything to any of y'all? High church, low church, okay. Those were actually terms. Uh, um, you know, uh, uh, Episcopal, Presbyterian, high church, okay. A L- lot of tradition, L- low church, Baptist, okay. <laughs> Okay, in other words, but just there's still some of that connectedness to Catholicism in a sense in the Protestant Reformation that took place. And so high church, a lot more liturgy, low church, no liturgy. Okay, we, we, but we still have ritual, even if you have a Baptist background. But this is the first season in the Christian church calendar of the year, which makes sense. The birth of Jesus leading up to Christmas and including the four preceding Sundays. So what is today? It is the first Sunday of the Advent season because between now and December 25th, it's the 1st, it's the 8th, it's the 15th, and it's the 22nd. So we are kicking off Advent right now. And that's what Paul is telling them at Galatia and in Philippi. Uh, The term Advent also has a reference to the second coming of Jesus when he comes back for the last time. That will be the Advent of the Savior to the world. So anyway, in the verses in Galatians and in Philippians, we find some very important things. And uh, the first one was, uh, it's about the advent of the Savior. And what we discover about the advent of the Savior is first, we see his divine origin, where Jesus came from. There was an event that took place before the birth of Christ in the manger, even before the conception of Jesus in the womb of Mary. And that event was the sending of Christ from God the Father to the earth. We're told in Galatians 4, 4, when the fullness of time was come, when it was just right, God sent his son. Christ had always existed with the Father. Jesus the Christ was now born on earth. John clarifies this a little bit in chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning of the world was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word, capital W, was God. So, so when was the beginning? Well, that was a creation. But billions of years before creation, Jesus already was. Jesus comes out of eternity to meet us. In the beginning was the Word. He was already existing when the Word was. As a man, Jesus prayed to the Father in John chapter 17 verse 5 and he says, And now, O Father, glorify me with your own self, with the glory which I had with you before the world ever was. Here's the kicker. God loved us so much that even in his foreknowledge, knowing that when that day came that he would create us and we would reject him and sin, he still made us anyway. Think through this very carefully. I'm not going to ask for a public answer. If you knew your kids were going to turn out lousy, would you have them? (laughs) If you knew that they were going to be rebellious and angry and disobedient and intolerant and spiteful and hateful and gave you a cold shoulder and only came to you when they wanted something and the rest of the time ignored you, And if I'm describing any of your children, it is not intentional. (laughs) Because we can have them like that. But if you knew that before conception, would you have them? God did. God did. He knew the extent of our rebellion. And that is why before he ever created us, knowing what we would become... He said, I'm going to send them an antidote. I'm going to provide for them a remedy. It's their choice to accept the remedy, but there will be those who will accept my choice. I love them that much. I'm going to go ahead and create them in spite of all the heartache they can cause to the world, and I'm going to send them the solution to their problem if they want them. And that's what God did. He sent his son. Christ had always existed in a perfect, loving relationship with God the Father. And one day at the precise time, God sent him forth. It was God's plan even before the world. 1 Peter 1.20 says, Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world was manifest now in these last times to you. Jesus made a conscious choice on his own to be sent. Not only did the Father design it, but the Son went along with it. Philippians 2, Let this mind be 
in you, which was also in Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it robbery to not to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and became a servant in the likeness of men. And verse 13 is a kicker. I had, I've kind of ignored, I guess, verse 13 in Philippians chapter 2. But verse 13 says, For it is God who works in you to will and to act for his good purpose. Remember Paul, same writer here, writes in Romans. Romans he wrote towards the end of his life. So very mature believer. Walked with God, grew with God for a long time. Had already written several books. And now he writes Romans. And he said, there's this warfare going on within me. The things that I want to do, I don't do. And the things I shouldn't do, I do do. And as you know, I end up in do do. That's not a literal translation, but it's close. Jesus said, there are things that I want that I can't will to happen. And there are things that I don't will to happen, but I can't help myself. And God says, through Paul now in Galatians, that because of Christ in you, he will provide us the ability to will what he wills and to act what he wants to carry out in our life for his good purpose. And do you think it's for his good purpose it will be good for us? I suggest to you if it's for his good purpose it will be great for us. You see, we got to get to a place where our intimacy with God and with Christ is the same kind of intimacy that Jesus had with the Father as he knelt in the Garden of Gethsemane the night of his betrayal. And Jesus, as man, said, Father, is there another way? Could you do this differently? But then he said, not my will, but yours be done in me. Shelly, there it is. I wasn't searching for my heart, though it is in there. Shelly sent me a text early this morning, not, not the one of the broken tent. Um, she did send that one, but before that, it was terrific. It was out of um, Jesus Calling for today. Any of you read it yet this morning? Okay, two of you, great. It would be wonderful if... A hundred of you did. You can get it on your phone, download it, be right there for you. Jesus, it's free, I think, even, right? Yeah. Listen to it. Modern man has lost the perspective of eternity. We live for right now, this moment. Don't see the big picture. To distract himself from the gaping jaws of death, humanity engages in ceaseless activity and amusement. Sound like your world at all? Got to always be doing something? The practice of being still in my presence is almost a lost art. Yet it is this very stillness that enables us to experience the eternal love of God. You need the certainty of my loving presence, God says, in order to weather the storms of life. During times of severe testing, even the best theology can fail if it isn't accompanied by experiential knowledge of me. The ultimate protection against sinking during life's storms is devoting time to develop your relationship with me. Listen to that last line. I'm going to read it again. The ultimate protection against sinking during life's storms. Listen carefully. It doesn't say the ultimate protection from life's storms. We will have storms in this world. We will have problems. You may have had one this week. There was a broken leg Thanksgiving Day. I don't know how big your storm was or how little your storm was, but there will be storms. And being a Christian doesn't guarantee no storms. But it says what will keep us from sinking 
during life's storms is devoting time to develop your relationship with me. Amen. That is right on the money. And so, in order, God who works in us to will and act according to his purpose requires we devote time to a relationship with him. You said, Tim, that's what I'm doing here today. It's not enough. I don't care if Billy Graham preached from this pulpit every Sunday morning. It would not be enough. You got to do it on your own. In love for humanity, the Father sent the Son. In love for the Father and humanity, Jesus willingly went. Jesus willingly and obediently and lovingly left a place of glory and sinlessness and ceaseless worship and perfection and unbroken fellowship with his Father. From the bosom of the Father to the womb of Mary, Jesus went. Imagine all the fullness of the Godhead was dwelling inside this young virgin girl. This is his divine origin. But not only do these passages reveal to us the divine origin that comes from God, but it reveals to us his full humanity. It says, made of a woman. Isn't that awesome? Made of a woman. I've said this before in church. Some of you may have not been here. Ladies, I got good news for you. You do not pass the sin nature onto your children. Sorry, men. It's all on us. How do we know that? Was Jesus born of a woman? Yes. Did he have a sin nature? So what's the only difference? Father. Father. So ladies, though you were the first to sin... I, I had, it, it's my duty to keep you humble. <laughs> it comes down through us. We pass it on. God sent forth his son. That statement could not be said about anybody else in the history of the world. Only Jesus. The next statement, made of a woman. That is true of all of us. While Jesus was fully divine in his origin, he was likewise fully human in his birth. He entered the world just like you and I. He was born of a woman. He was a man. He was Mary's son. He hungered and thirsted. He ate and he drank and he worked and he played and he laughed and he wept and he hurt and he, and he bled and he prayed and he lived and he died as a man. In Hebrews 5 and John 7 and 1 John 4, his time on earth is referred to as the days of flesh. If you wonder what it must have been like for God to become a man, perhaps C.S. Lewis, maybe one of the smartest men who ever lived, can help us. Uh, I make assumptions and I shouldn't. Uh, how many of you know who C.S. Lewis is? Raise your hand. It's a, how many of you have no idea? It's okay who C.S. Lewis How many of you are just not going to raise your hand at all? Yeah. Okay. Uh, C.S. Lewis wrote Chronicles of Narnia. That's what he's most noted for. You could read all seven books of the Chronicles of Narnia. You could read it in seven days. You can. Book a day, not, not that hard to do. It's easy reading. It was C.S. Lewis writing for children. But C.S. Lewis thought if you wrote for a child, an adult should enjoy it as well. It's a beautiful story, an allegory of who Jesus is, portrayed as Aslan the Lion. But probably the single greatest literary work that Lewis has contributed to the world was his apologetic book that he wrote entitled Mere Christianity. I will challenge you to read Mere Christianity with understanding in one week. It probably can't be done. You probably need a month or more. Mere Christianity is, it's, it's challenging. Lewis, is, Lewis was an atheist who wanted desperately to prove to the world that God did not exist. And in that effort, he didn't know he would bump shoulders with a guy by the name of J.R. Tolkien. Who through Tolkien, Lewis began to become open to this idea that God lives. And once Lewis became a Christian, he did the world a favor and he wrote Mere Christianity. That book, unbeknownst to C.S. Lewis, decades and decades later would be a book that would be given to a man who was going to prison. That book and a Bible 
was given by a businessman out of Chicago to Chuck Colson after he had been arrested and accused of Watergate crimes. And through the Bible and mere Christianity, Colson became a believer and the founder of Prison Fellowship now resides in heaven today. And in the book, Mere Christianity, Lewis attempts to help us understand God becoming a man. Lewis writes, did you ever think when you were a child what fun it would be if your toys could come to life? Well, suppose you could really have brought one of them to life. Imagine turning a tin soldier into a real little man. It would involve turning the tin into flesh. And suppose the tin soldier did not like it. He is not interested in flesh. All he sees is that his tin has been spoiled. He thinks you are killing him. He will do everything he can to prevent you from doing it. He will not be made into a man if he can help it. What would you have done about that tin soldier? I do not know. But what God did about us was this. The second person of the Godhead, the Son, became human himself. He was born into the world an actual man, a real man of particular height, about five, eight and a half, with a particular color of hair, dark, slightly grain. Spe <laughs> that should have been funny. <laughs> Speaking a particular wet language, weighing so many pounds. The eternal being who knows everything and who created the entire universe became not only a man, but before that, a baby. And before that, a fetus inside a woman's body. If you want to get the hang of it, think how you would like it if you became a slug or a crab. Jesus' most frequent title for himself was Son of Man. He used it to stress his full humanity. After all, it was the seed of the woman, a man that would crush the head of the serpent, the devil. In Jesus chapter 3, verse 15, we have the first biblical prophetic utterance. And it comes from God himself as he speaks to Satan. And he says to Satan, Satan had just accomplished the coup of, of, of Eve and Adam, convincing them to sin. First, he conned Eve to do it, and then Eve convinced Adam to do it. And when God showed up in the garden and he confronted the serpent, which was really Satan himself, God said to Satan, I will put enmity between you and the woman. I know a lot of men who don't like snakes, but I have rarely met a woman who cares for them at all. There will be enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. Who's he talking about? She's talking about the Son of God who would be born of woman. I will put enmity between you two, and he will crush your head. You will strike his heel. Let me ask you this. Would you rather be struck or crushed? Satan got the bad end of this deal. I think that's good news for us. That's what Jesus did with his risen life from the tomb. Jesus became a man, sinless at his birth, to become sin at his death, so that we who are born sinful could become forgiven at our new birth and sinless at our death. What a great exchange. Then also we see from this verse that although he was God's son, he subjected himself to God's law. In fact, when he began to teach, he made clear that he had not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. Matthew 5.17 says, Think not that I have come to destroy the law of the prophets, but rather to fulfill them. And Christ did it perfectly. He fulfilled it not only outwardly, but perfectly obeying God's law from the heart. And this could not be said about any other man. Christmas is about the advent of the Savior. He lowered himself. He condescended. He came down so that we could go up. The second truth is the acceptance of sinners. Verse 5 begins with the word to, to redeem those under the law. That's what Jesus came to do for us, redeem us. Christ came to his own people and came to the world to set us free. Romans 2, 14 and 15 says, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these, having not the law, are law unto themselves, which shows the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts that mean while accusing are also accusing one another. And you're saying, Tim, what in the heck did you just say? What Paul said that Jesus intended is this. Even the Gentiles who did not grow up under the Mosaic law has a conscience in their heart of the things that God loves and the things God hates. The Ten Commandments. God doesn't like liars, but he loves sinners. God doesn't like adultery, but he loves sinners. 
God doesn't like blasphemy, but he loves those who blaspheme. You, you get the so picture? Even those who haven't been taught this, there is a consciousness within them that lets them know they need a change of heart. Adam and Eve broke one law, one command, and brought death not only to themselves but to all mankind. Let me say that God's law has not been done away with. God's law is just as solid as it has ever been. We have a culture today that wants to change the laws of God. The laws are still there. He doesn't, well, what we've done is we've changed those things so that we don't think we've broken God's law. We think that God will accept us if we change his law. No. God loves us in spite of the fact that we've broken the law and he wants us to come under his redemption so we don't have to continue breaking his laws. Therefore, since we that are saved are in Christ Jesus and he's in us, we keep the law through him. Ezekiel 18.20 says, The soul that sins, it shall die. But Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, chapter 2, verse 1, And you, has he quickened, he's brought to life, because we were once dead in our trespasses and sins. Jesus came to set us free. And how did he do it? Christ has redeemed us from the curse, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. And Jesus hung there to take the curse for you and me. Isaiah said in 53 verse 4, Surely Christ has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace are upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. None of us are left out. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on his son the iniquity of us all. Let me wrap this up with a third point. These two passages also tell us about the assurance of the Spirit in us. God inhabited human flesh in Galatians 4 and found in the fashion as a man, Philippians 2. All of those things took place outside of us. Our redemption, our adoption, these are things that we can know about and believe, but they all take place outside of us. We had absolutely nothing to do with those, but God wants to make it real again. And so God sends his son Jesus again to you. What are you going to do with him? God the Father sends his son Jesus to you again. God wants to become flesh again in you. By his spirit, the scripture says, we can now call him Abba Father, the Holy Spirit, the person of Jesus in us, doing in and through us what God the Father did in and through Jesus by the presence of the Holy Spirit in him, by that same presence in us, wants to do it again. Let this mind be in you. Let the spirit be in you. Which says, Abba, Father, dear Daddy. A term used by a loving and trusting child to his own father. Let me ask you a question. Do you talk to God like that on a daily basis? I don't mean when the storms come up. I mean personal time on a daily basis. Dear Daddy. My life's a mess right now. I don't know what caused it. Dear Daddy, my kids are screwing up. I don't know what to do. Dear Daddy, I'm sorry I haven't called you in a while. Sorry I haven't talked to you in a while. Unto us, a child is born. That's in my front lawn. But that's not where the message of Christmas was intended to end. You see, maybe next year we'll get three more ornaments that say, into us a child has come. Christ came unto us so that he can come into us. Do you realize that Jesus is into you? That used to be an expression. I don't know if it's still used anymore, but you know, hey, that girl, she's into me. Yeah, that guy, he's kind of into me. Do you understand? Jesus is into you. He loves you so much. He pursues you. He flirts with you. He may be flirting with you right now. That's called, that's called enticement. That's called conviction. 
That's Jesus knocking at the door, asking for a date. Will you come and spend time with me? Well, what do you need today? Why don't you say, dear daddy, whew, I sure could use some peace. I'm not telling you you can't ask God to take the chaos out of your life. But why don't you ask him for peace in spite of the chaos? For the Bible says Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Do you need joy? There it is. Take it. It's on the tree. The scripture says that the joy of Christ is unspeakable. Are you discontent? Paul says contentment from God is something he'll teach you. Paul said, I've learned what it is to be content in any and every situation. Whew. Have you lost hope? There it is. Romans 15, 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with joy and peace. If you got hope, you'll end up with joy and peace. Trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of who? The Holy Spirit. Not unto you a child is born, but in to you, a child is born. We let him come in. Count Zinzendorf. That really is a name. Google it. He was the founder of the Moravians. He was converted to an art gallery in Dusseldorf. I love that. Zinzendorf and Dusseldorf. While contemplating the painting of Christ on the cross, which had this inscription, I did this for you. What have you done for me? This picture had been painted by an artist over 300 years before he saw it. When the artist finished the first sketch of the Redeemer, the artist called in the daughter of his landlady and, and asked her, uh, who does this look like? And the young girl said, that looks like a really good man. And the artist realized he had failed. And he destroyed the sketch. And he painted the second one. And then he called the little girl to come back in and to look at it again. And, and he, he asked her, who, 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 who does this look like? And the girl looked at it a second time and she said it looks like a, a person who has suffered greatly. And the artist realized I've, I failed again and he destroyed his second sketch. And he prayed and he meditated and he spent time alone with God and then he made the third sketch. And when it was finished he called the same girl back for a third time and he asked her young lady, who is it? And instantly, as soon as she saw it, she said, It is my Lord! And the artist knew he had finally gotten it right. That alone makes the coming of Christ meaningful to the world. Not that a good man came, not that a wise teacher came, not that a great sufferer came, but that God, Emmanuel, God in us, has come. Is Jesus this morning only unto you? Or is he in to you? You get to call the shot. If you've never invited Christ, oh, maybe you've been to church dozens if not hundreds of times, but you've never invited Jesus to come in your life, why don't you do that right now in a closing prayer? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand to come forward, but seated right where you are, just say, Jesus, I've only looked at you as unto us, a child is born, but today I want you to be birthed in me. No special formula. An honest confession of your soul. Jesus, you are God the Son. I need you. Come live in my life. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for your love. Thank you for this season that prompts us to think more about your love. And Father, I pray for that man or that woman or that young person in the sanctuary today who Christmas has just been a holiday season, but they want today to become a holy moment. Today be a moment like it was in Bethlehem when Mary and Joseph contemplated all that had happened. Thank you for hearing the prayer of a man or a woman who says, Lord, I need you to come into me. I don't want you just standing at the door and knocking. I want you to come in and be in my life. I want to start this Advent season right. Thank you for hearing all of our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have a great day.